what the umpires are perceiving matches how his approach is working anyway. I'm not sure it's costing him as much as people think because, yeah, they're they're expanding up a little bit, but he's already looking to hit that pitch. There's a drive way back. It might be. It could be. It is. Holy cow. Welcome to another broadcast of Bricks Behind the Ivy. Hey, hey, Cub fans, welcome to another episode of Bricks Behind the Ivy. I am always your host, Jeff Candy Cubs Rigowskis, and thank you so much for listening in. If you're listening on the audio, make sure to hit that subscribe and review the podcast wherever you're listening to help increase reach. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and leave comments below the episodes. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate all of your time, and it was a good week in Cubs baseball as we saw some wins as they are entering a stretch of winnable games to try to keep their playoff hopes alive. If you've been listening long enough, you know that the first segment of Bricks Behind the Ivy is the box score blitz, where we go over the box scores for the games in as quick as possible. And we're going to do a little bit of a change this week. I'm going to limit myself to 60 seconds to talk about the game since last week. And we're going to put a little bit of a timer on the screen to keep me honest, and we'll see what we get. So put some time on the literal clock. Three, two, one 60 second box score blitz go the cubs were home for all six games this week with three versus the blue jays and three versus the tigers they took two out of three in the blue jays series all three of these games being one run affairs with no run scored by the cubs on sunday friday had a hectic air special and she blew a save but say suzuki walked it off and there was joy in wrigleyville cubs then welcomed the tigers which they took two out of three and they welcomed javier Baez back with a nice tribute javier Saad pitched in the series and he looked like he did before the injured bliss with 5.2 innings pitch six hits and seven k's moving east and west like he does. Game 3 we saw an Amaya Grand Slam. Cubs released Hector Neris this week, bringing up Jack Neely to get who they got in the Mark Leiter Jr. trade, and he gets his first MLBK. Cubs maintain their 66% winning percentage, as they need that in order to get the 87 wins per Lance Prostowski. Player of the Week, PCA, 6.7% K rated, one home run, one double, three RBIs with a 125 weight of runs created plus, and Justin Steele is our Pitcher of the Week with 7 innings pitch, 4 hits, 2 runs, and 10 Ks. And that's our box score blitz. Slightly over the 60 seconds. We'll see how I can do next week. Do you think you could do better? Can you sum up the Cubs wins in a week in 60 seconds or best? How do you think I did? Leave mm, some notes in the comments and let me know how you think you did and how you like the new format of the box score blitz. Well, Harry Carey's got a special segment this week. He will be coming on to talk about Javier Baez and his return to Wrigley Field in Deep Thoughts with Harry Carey. Take it away, Harry. Holy cow! Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to another set of Deep Thoughts back here on the Bricks Behind the Ivy podcast with your guy, the man, Harry. <laughs> Well, I'm coming at you this week to go ahead and give a big old shout out, first of all, to all those amazing Cub fans out there at the old ball yard the other night that was out there against the Detroit Tigers that was giving our guy, our man, good old El Mago, a standing ovation. You know, that shows class. That shows heart. And that shows that we'll never forget the 2016 ball club that ended the 108 year drought. So for all those beautiful Cup fans out there, this beer's for you. Ooh, boy, oh boy. But you know, while we're on the topic, let's talk about old Javi, don't you know? Why don't we, you know what I mean? I had the interns run some stats because my normal guys, uh, they're all off in college and doing Lord knows what. But in any event, you know, We all loved Javi back in the day. You know, this was a young kid out of Arlington Country High School back in Jacksonville, Florida. Drafted him in the first round back in 2011, ninth overall. 
kid had a lot of potential, you know, the organization saw a lot in this kid, drafted him, and, you know, he moved his way up, and boy, did he make a splash early. I mean, this kid was an all-star throughout his entire trip through the uh, the minor leaguers, you know, from 2012 all the way up to 2015, you know, did a couple of minor stints up at the old ball yard in Chicago. But, you know, he worked on his craft down in the minors, and boy, did he make a splash. You know, the two memorable years that I had the guys run the, the stats, you know, 2016, you know, the big year, the, the, the pop and circumstance, you know, and 421 at bat, and uh, he had 115 hits with 19 doubles, he had a triple and 14 donger. With 59 RBIs hitting 273, you know. He was at a crucial, crucial part of the ball club. His defense, I don't know how the heck he's doing the, the tag when he's pointing, he's pointing, he's tag. How did he do that? I can't even walk down Rush Street in a straight line, but he's catching and tagging and not even looking. <laughs> you know, but his best year, boy, oh boy, in 2018 when he hit 290, I mean, the guy had 34 dongers and 111 RBIs and, you know, and 606 at-bats, so he was amazing, you know, but it was a shame to see him go and, you know, KB and Rizzo and Schwarbino, but, you know, we'll never forget that 2016 ball club and and all the excitement, Javi. I mean, I don't even remember when he ran to first and did the old Watusi up and down the line. I, I don't know what he was doing, but he let that guy score. I mean, the magic that that guy did at the on the field and at the plate, boy, oh boy. So, you know, El Mago, this bears for you, buddy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. You know, and, and I can't help but wonder... You know, Dansby got a hold of that one that night, you know. Wonder if he was kind of feeling a little, I don't know, jealousy, you know, for all the Javi love. And he, boom, shaka locka that one out on the left. But, you know, Javi, we love you. Best of luck in Detroit, you know. Got to focus on the ball club. We got three down in Miami. Party in the city when the heat is on. <laughs> And then we got three in Pittsburgh, but let's go get them, boys. Javi, we love you. And from all of us down here at the Wrigley Fire Bar and Grill, and from all of us at BBTI, so long, everybody. Javier Baez was such a big part of the 2016 Cub team and such a big part of that era. All those plays that he had, all the exciting plays, including fooling Will Craig in 2021 on his way to first base up Wilson Contreras score and basically a ground ball to first base, all the El Mago play like Javi. He left such a cultural imprint on this organization. And honestly, it's hard for me to see what he's become. The fall off has been quick and tragic. There was not a pitch in the zone that he swung at in his four strikeout game the other night in his return to Wrigley Field and he was benched for the benefit of a rookie that Detroit's trying to take a look at and looks like his time in Detroit might be coming to an end but tip of a cap to Javier Baez who brought so much to this organization so much joy and I really appreciate everything he did for the Cubs organization what's your favorite Javier Baez memory Leave some messages in the comments, find us on Twitter or social media and let me know. And we can kind of share some clips and share some memories as we remember one of the great Cubs of the 2016 World Series team. Speaking of great things that are in Wrigleyville and are important to 2016, you cannot go a Bricks Behind the Ivy episode without mentioning our sponsor, Wrigleyville Sports. Wrigleyville Sports has been around since 1990, and they have the best sports Chicago sports merchandise in town. They are adjacent to Wrigley Field, they have a friendly staff, and they can even make you a custom jersey in short format so that you can wear it to the game at the friendly confines. If you have been listening well, you know we have a coupon code. So at checkout, use the code IV10. Once again, that's IV10 for 10% off your order at Wrigleyville Sports. Bear season's coming. Maybe you need that Caleb Williams jersey. Check them out. Get that 10% off. And thank you, as always, to our sponsor, Wrigleyville Sports. So this week, I wanted to discuss 
something that has been going around the internet, and it is the hot button topic of Seiya Suzuki's Strike Zone. Seiya Suzuki has been known to receive some pretty bad calls, at least compared to you know what we're seeing on TV and some analytical people out there have looked and seen that he has gotten some bad calls, more balls called strikes than any other player since 2022. So what's going on there? Is this a thing? Is this something that Saya needs to work on? Is it something umpires need to work on? Is it an illusion created by the magical box we see on TV? Well, Matt Trueblood of Northside Baseball wrote an article about that this week that I thought was excellent. You should really check it out. There'll be a link in the bio. But I brought him on to kind of discuss it more with us to see, is there such thing as a Seiya Suzuki strike zone? Check out this segment. All right, Cub fans, thanks for sticking around. Today, I have joining me is Mr. Matt Trueblood, who is the editor over at Northside Baseball, a place that I contribute to, and he also contributes to a few other team sites associated with Northside Baseball. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to do it. Big fan. Uh, I appreciate uh, you hopping on, and also I appreciate you taking a chance on on me on your website, which has turned into me meeting folks that led to this podcast. So uh, you can kind of take some origination credit uh, <laughs> in first behind the Ivy. So um, now that's recorded, uh, you can take me to court, uh, like the Winklevoss twins on ownership of Facebook. Uh, so. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I always wanted to be is the Winklevoss twins. <laughs> yeah, that's what everyone strives to be. Uh, so uh, we do have a very specific topic I brought you on in an article you wrote recently that I think is a very hot topic amongst Cub fans. But it is a BBTI tradition to kind of talk about your baseball story or your baseball mm-hmm. fandom. And yeah, so you are the editor for Northside Baseball. You do a bunch of different things. Uh, you've been on local radio talking about the Cubs and such. How did you get into baseball? And just kind of give us a little bit of background of what you do now professionally. Yeah, uh, so I grew up mostly in Appleton, Wisconsin. Moved there when my family moved there when I was five. So I could have just as easily, I guess, been a Brewers fan, except not really. <laughs> my <laughs> folks are both from central Illinois. My mom's from Champaign. My dad's from Peoria. And uh, my dad, especially, I guess, was just a big Cubs fan. And right from, you know, I, I can remember the first we didn't have cable. So weren't like watching baseball games regularly at all until I was eight, the spring of 97. Great year for the Cubs. Wonderful time to become a Cubs fan, (laughs) 1997. In that it's excellent training for the overall experience of being a Cubs fan. My earliest memory of watching the Cubs is I come home from school, I turn on WGN on our brand new cable, you know, very exciting. (laughs) And I watch the Cubs finish off a victory and hear Harry Carey say, you'll never see a happier one in 14 team. Uh, Because they had had lost the first 14 games of the season. And I, being eight years old and eternally optimistic, I guess, (laughs) good disposition for a Cubs fan, I uh, didn't think, oh gosh, they lost the first 14 games. No, I thought, hey, never see a happier team. Cool. That, <laughs> that must be something I want to be involved in. And so I was hooked. Uh, I was hooked by watching them win their first game of the season in their 15th game of the season. Uh, from there, it's just been straight through. Uh, my first game at Wrigley was Rhino's final home game. Um and it was magic. It was awesome. And after the game, my dad, you know, player parking back then, that rickety chain link fence on yeah. the grimy parking lot that I desperately miss um, because <laughs> I'm a weirdo about the renovation. But uh, player parking, you know, we're out there waiting for autographs, and there's just a, a mob trying to get Ryan Sandberg's autograph at his last home game. My dad put me up on his shoulders and rhino comes out and i'm kind of like yeah rhino rhino uh you know my dad's imploring me to try and get his hero's autograph right uh Mm. and i was interested but uh when sammy came out i basically like broke my father's neck off leaning and (laughs) lunging and reaching and and got sammy sosa's autograph and 
oh, hooked, that's cool. completely hooked and never, never let go. Obviously I, I ended up taking just a very, I love baseball. I, I probably jumped in being more just a fan of the Cubs and then baseball is what they played, which I think is how a lot of us come to things early in life identifying. And, you know, we identify what the person that brings us into the game, if it's a parent or a grandparent or a friend or whoever, we want to see what makes them so happy. What makes them happy is their team winning. So then you start rooting for their team, but you don't necessarily immediately fall in love with the sport. It's more like, we want to see the Cubs win, win, you know, our team, our, our laundry. <laughs> uh, eventually I realized the sport to me is even more beautiful and wonderful than any one team. And so I, you know, it, it has mostly been a side hustle throughout my adult life. Um, writing just a ton about baseball on the side for baseball prospectus uh, for twins. Day. And now I'm, based in the Twin Cities out here in the north suburbs of Minneapolis. And eventually I was sort of able to transfer that and I still hold fandom, but it's not just for the Cubs and it's not exclusive really in any way. I just love the game and I love talking to baseball fans and all the different ways that we experience and um, see into and see around and see through the game and how it brings us together and all of it. So uh, very much a Cubs fan still, but also I write write and edit at Twins Daily and at Brewer Fanatic and still at Baseball Prospectus. So, you know, it's uh, it started as a love of the Cubs. It became a love of baseball broadly, but I don't think that's necessarily diminished. Loving the Cubs, it's just changed how I experience it. No, that's really cool. And I think... It's funny to you know start your cubdom in '97 with after that long losing streak, and then you know immediately getting some you know vindication in 1998 of yeah. a playoff yeah. team. I think uh, it's something very different about you know the more modern cub fan is you know before 2015 you could count the number of times they made the playoffs on one hand, and it was so it was like this event just making the playoffs, and then obviously expectations have, have shifted dramatically and, you know, people feel very strongly about the frustration of them not being in the playoffs this long, but this is a short period of time without the playoffs compared to their prior history. But, you know, that window and the thing that happened in 2016 has, you know, changed everything. So I wanted to talk to you about an article you wrote and I'll put it in the link in the description of this podcast for folks to read. Say Suzuki. Say Suzuki has kind of, you know, gotten this reputation of not getting the best strike zone. There's a lot of balls and strikes that get called on him that don't seem to get called on other players. And I don't know if it's just something that has been pointed out and there's a little bit of like a recency bias or this thing that we're all constantly searching for. But it does seem that his zone has been very different than other players. And you wrote a piece for Northside Baseball about the dynamics of that zone. And I kind of wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit. What are the, what are the big things you found about say Suzuki zone? Is he getting picked on by the umpires or is it (laughs) something else? I think it's definitely something else, which isn't to say it's nothing. And and I do want to, you know, say that, that, I, I don't think umpires as a group have like a significant racial bias we should worry about. Not that that couldn't happen or couldn't happen with certain umpires, but as a group, I wouldn't say that's probably what's going on. There was a story that came out around the same time as the one that I wrote that we're talking about here, where they talked about a, a theory that Craig Council mentioned that kind of the more you speak up for yourself, the more you complain to an umpire when you don't get a call, the more likely you might be to get the call in the future. To some of us, that's counterintuitive. It's like, you don't want to become that naggy person. Uh, The umpires might react against you that way. But in reality, in, in practical terms, and there have been studies on this, complaining a little bit, if you do it right, 
tends to, over time, earn you some extra calls from umpires. And one thing that, because even more so than a native Spanish speaker who has been around more English speakers probably throughout a good chunk of their lives, who has a, you know, their native language is a little more closely related to English than Japanese is. Um, I think a lot of Japanese players have a hard time speaking up for themselves, even if they're disposed to do so, which some of them aren't for various reasons. But uh, I think some guys have a hard time doing just that little bit of politicking you need to do. And that's not their fault. And it's something that we should work to correct. And I do think that is one dynamic with Saya. I think another dynamic is he's an extremely patient hitter. And if you're an extremely patient hitter, you're going to take more bad called strikes than most hitters because you're swinging less often at the edges of the zone than most hitters. We have to correct for that. And too often people overlook that aspect. People will lament not just Saya, but there have been several Cubs over the years where people were like, why is he getting this terrible zone? Kyle Schwarber, people used to talk about the yeah. same thing. Um, a lot of it was Kyle Schwarber was a very selective hitter. Well, that's, that's a good thing. That's a virtue up to a point. You have to manage the zone very carefully because you're going to work some deep counts and you're going to occasionally take a called third strike right on the edge that, yeah, you might have been right about it, but I'm not sure you knew for sure you were right about it. You just felt like that probably wasn't a strike. And a lot of other guys would have swung at that pitch in that situation and might have done something good with it. So part of it is approach. But really, the interesting thing that I found when I dug deep into it is that Seiya Suzuki's zone is not especially wide or especially narrow. It's pretty much right on the edges, as most players' zones are. He gets a lot of strikes called that are ruled as high, that the model says are high. When you see those fun facts on Marquis about he's had the most strikes called outside the zone of any hitter in baseball since 2022, hmm. it's pretty much all high strikes. He also has a lot of pitches at the bottom of the zone that technically are in the zone, according to, or at least are kind of 50 50 balls, according to these models, that aren't called strikes. So it's not necessarily that he has a bigger zone than most guys. It's that umpires have sort of subtly shifted his zone upward on him. And that can be for all kinds of reasons. It also kind of matches what Seiya himself does. He swings more high in the zone and swings less down at the bottom of the zone. So it's sort of what the umpires are perceiving matches how his approach is working anyway. I'm not sure it's costing him as much as people think because yeah, they're, they're expanding up a little bit, but he's already looking to hit that pitch. When he lets that go, often it's because he was fooled. Often it's because he you know, wasn't able to pull that trigger, but he wanted to. When he lets him go at the bottom of the zone, because it's not where he wants to hit the ball, the way his swing is set up, umpires are often giving him the benefit of the doubt. What it really led me to was the strike zone subjective. And folks don't like to think about that, and we don't like to admit that, but up and down vertically, you know, horizontally, it's the edges of the plate. That's a physical thing. It's on the ground right there in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. Vertically, well, what counts as the hollow of a guy's knee? What counts as the top of the letters? And how much of a croucher is the umpire accounting for? How much should he account for? Uh, stuff like that is variable and fluid and up for all kinds of interpretation and we're not comfortable with that in this day and age of the very computerized strike zone. At some levels of professional baseball, literally the computerized strike zone, but we can't escape it. And say a Suzuki is a great example of that. Yeah. I think too, there's a component with him, especially when he was, you know, had his benching uh, or break from David Ross last year. <laughs> yeah. Say a Suzuki seems to have a, like a pitch selection, like yip that kind of, you know, exemplifies itself a few times a year where he seems to take pitches for the sake of taking pitches because it's part mm -hmm. of his strategy, but then he misses very hittable pitches because he's maybe predetermined he's going to take uh, to try to get himself going. And I think, you know, we've actually kind of entered a stretch recently of him struggling and, you know, the K rate being higher and, you know, not good quality contact. But in the last like three games, 
contact quality has increased significantly, and so is his swing rate on early in the count pitches. So it's uh, it seems like it's this constant dance with him of how he's attacked and then his approach, and then like he gets very very mental about it. But um, you know, I do want to talk about that um, the zone and the the box on TV, mm-hmm. and we had a little pre conversation about this. You know, what, what are your thoughts about that? And do you think it helps the viewing experience or do you think it can hinder the viewing experience just given the, I would say, like the reactionary nature of the Twitter vacuum and the Internet today when it comes to professional sports and, you know, our ability to get information immediately and to want to react when it doesn't go your way in a very, very, very visceral manner? (laughs) Well, I think you led me right to the answer I would probably give which is I don't love the box. I don't think it invites the best version of baseball watching, I guess is the way I would put it. I don't, the strike zone is obviously really important to baseball. Strikeouts and walks, we're getting more and more of them these days and they define how the game unfolds. But I don't think it's the main thing that people want to watch baseball for. And I think we should find creative ways on broadcasts to de-emphasize it. And instead, by having this camera that focuses only on batter, pitcher, catcher, and draws a box and sometimes increases the contrast within that box to really make you focus on the strike zone, broadcasts are begging you to spend all your time thinking about the strike zone. (laughs) And they want you to think about it as a concrete square. As, you know, that top and zone, they draw lines there. There are probably visual solutions you could create. I mean, you could probably just have vertical lines to show the edges of the plate. But whenever they made the sort of graphics on TV decisions about how to display this stuff, they didn't think that would look as good. And maybe they're right. I don't know. But what they've done is make us all think there's a hard bottom and a hard top to every strike zone. It just isn't. That's not real. (laughs) So we end up getting angry over things that don't need to be our primary focus in a baseball game and getting what we feel is very righteously angry, very like that was a strike. That was not a strike. And you know, the marquee they'll replay it and Boog and JD will go, Oh man. Yeah, that's a strike based on whether it hits the little line along the top or bottom of the zone in that 3d computerized recreation. And I'm left sitting there going, guys, that line, you made that up. That's (laughs) not there. The umpire can't see it. Uh, it's just not, that's not how it works. And I don't think it needs to be how it works. That part really, I think, separates me from other people. But I don't think that needs to be how it works. There should be a little bit of flow to, based on the approach angle of the pitch, based on how the batter sets up, or like Saya, based on what he's looking to do in the box anyway, and his swing plane and all of that. I think umpires and batters and catchers and pitchers should be able to sort of come to a, it's an adversarial negotiation that they're in over (laughs) where, where that zone stops and starts. Right. But it can just be a negotiation. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with pitch framing. And I am actually not fine at all with the idea that there's a top line and a bottom line and TV should show it to us. And we should all just accept that those lines are correct which is all to say none of the biggest thing, which I know you know too, which is that they're wrong a lot in just how they draw the box. Sometimes the box will be way up here at a guy's chest and the next batter, it'll be like below his belly button. And you're like, you're supposed to think that both of those are exactly accurate. (laughs) It's nuts to me. It's nuts. I don't get it. Yeah, I think it's, you know, for me, it's it definitely takes away from the viewing experience from time to time because, you know, you do get held up on what the pitch location is and you're not really focusing on, like, how the pitcher is pitching. You're focusing on where the pitches are. And I think that, you know, it takes away from, you know, the value of a pitcher, which, you know, with, you know, rule changes and such that have been proposed recently of, like, six-inning limits for starters and we're not mm-hmm. going to go down that rabbit hole. But, you know, there is a you know, there is an art to pitching and getting through a lineup. And, you know, without that box, you start to notice like tendencies and how a guy 
is attacked by a certain pitcher and how they change that up, like going through a lineup. Those are things that I pay attention to, but I find myself paying attention to them less because I'm so fixated on the presentation of the box. And it's, it's tough, too, in a sport that has a very small margin for error. And, mm. you know, we've, we've shifted to the, the, um, the money ball, rest in peace, Billy Bean uh, approach of, you know, on base percentage and strikeouts and home runs and, you know, trying to, you know, reduce shifting and stuff to increase the, you know, the use of contact. But we're also like seeing the best velocity and the best stuff we've ever seen from pitchers that is making all of that way more challenging. And, you know, the, the ether constantly screaming, just hit the ball the other way and all these things <laughs> like that. It's just, it's not that yeah. simple. Like we, we keep narrowing the window of success by increasing velocity. And, you know, I think people think like a unified strike zone is what's going to solve all these problems, but it, it's not, it's not the only problem. There's, there's a lot of problems and it's, uh, yeah, I think it's just ultimately very distracting. And I agree with what you said, but I appreciate you coming on and talking to us about say a strike zone. If people are looking for you on social media or, you know, on Northside baseball, uh, if you want to give a quick plug of where they can find you and what you've got cooking and you know, what, what else you've got going on, feel free to do that now. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty much what you just said. I mean, check out, <laughs> I'm on Twitter at M a true blood. And that's where I will tweet out pretty much everything I write, which tends to be a lot. <laughs> uh, it'll be stuff on the Cubs. And right now I'm working on a piece on Miguel Amaya, whom we've seen. I, I think we've seen make important and interesting changes the last month or so. I also think we've maybe overstated them or gotten a little confused on what we're seeing <laughs> because there's a lot of chaos, even, even post a uh, big fix with Amaya. There's been a lot of chaos in his sort of, adjustments of late but I'm writing about that I'll be writing about all things cubs and more importantly i think we're building a cool community with you doing a lot of uh, of this podcast and, and hopefully some more written stuff um we've got a growing staff of other writers who are bringing you different perspectives on the cubs and will continue to through the balance of this season and into what's going to be a fascinating off season and you can also check out my stuff on other teams at Twins Daily, Brewer Fanatic, Baseball Prospectus, and hope you do. Well, thank you again so much for hopping on. And, yeah, please go check out Northside Baseball. You can find my uh, random writings there from time to time, uh, links to, to the podcast and my personal blog, and all of Matt's just excellent analytical work on things going on under the hood for different players on the Cubs. Thanks, Matt. Hope to have you on again soon. Thanks. If you're not reading Matt Trueblood stuff or following him on Twitter, you should be. He has a great analytical mind. He puts some great content out there for Baseball Prospectus and for Northside Baseball and has some great stuff for Twins Fanatic and Brewer Fanatic as well. So Twins Daily and Brewer Fanatic. So go check that out. I'll leave his information in the description of the podcast so you can go see some of his work. But what do you think? Do you think the box that shows what's balls and strikes on TV is kind of ruining the experience? Do you think Seiya Suzuki should speak up a little bit for himself? Let me know in the comments and, you know, we can discuss, you know, is the Seiya Suzuki strike zone something that can be fixed? If you are looking for a quick recap of the Cubs from the minor leagues in Myrtle Beach all the way up to the major leagues at 1060 West, check out our new video series on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube called The Scorecard. It is a 60-second recap of all things going on across the Cubs system that comes out daily. So make sure you're checking that out and sharing it. It's for casuals. It's for diehards so you know how different prospects are doing, how Cubs are doing across the organization, and giving you a quick recap and some highlights of of the big moments from the day before. Well, that's all the time we have for this week on Bricks Behind the Ivy. If you have not hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. If you have not shared this podcast to a friend, share this podcast to a friend. Make sure that we continue to help grow Bricks Behind the Ivy and make sure you're reviewing this wherever you're listening to your podcast. Until next week, go Cubs. Let's see if we can dig this thing out and make the playoffs.
if you are looking for a quick recap of the Cubs from the minor leagues in Myrtle Beach all the way up to the major leagues at 1060 West, check out our new video series on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube called The Scorecard. It is a 60-second recap of all things going on across the Cubs system that comes out daily. So make sure you're checking that out and sharing it. It's for casuals. It's for diehards so you know how different prospects are doing, how Cubs are doing across the organization, and giving you a quick recap and some highlights of of the big moments from the day before. Well, that's all the time we have for this week on Bricks Behind the Ivy. If you have not hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. If you have not shared this podcast to a friend, share this podcast to a friend. Make sure that we continue to help grow Bricks Behind the Ivy and make sure you're reviewing this wherever you're listening to your podcast. Until next week, go Cubs. Let's see if we can dig this thing out and make the playoffs.